All righty. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Mind Walks Lecture Series. My name is Monica Rutherford, and I'm the Community Outreach Manager with the Central Coast State Parks Association, or CESPA. Um, we are the nonprofit partner to the state parks in Slow County, so we fundraise for their educational programs. So everything from um, lecture programs like this to exhibits at the Morrow Bay Museum of Natural History, all sorts of fun things. Um, the Virtual Mind Walks Lecture Series is offered twice a month on Fridays, and it features subject matter experts talking about um, all sorts of things relating to our Central Coast. And today we're super excited to have Jeff Ebner here. I'll introduce him in just a second. Um, so for today, you are welcome to ask questions as you think of them. Just use the chat button or the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can type it right in there and we will get to questions at the very end. And um, the MindWalks program is underwritten by the Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Eltsroth Fund and supported by us here at CSPA. And if you want to learn more about how you can also support educational programs, um, feel free to check out the link on the bottom of your screen there, centralcoastparks.org slash friend. And there's lots of opportunities for you to get involved. Um, today's presentation will be recorded. So if you want to pass it along to a friend or if you have to dip out early, it will be posted to the State Parks YouTube page where we have a huge archive of past virtual mind walks um, of all sorts of different topics. So if you're signed up for our newsletter, you will get that link um, when it gets posted. Alrighty, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. So today um, is our presentation is called Deep Dive into Maps, How and Why We Locate, Visualize and Analyze Data. And we are with Jeff Ebner, who is an environmental scientist with California State Parks. Uh, Jeff Ebner loves maps. He graduated with a BS in environmental management and protection from Cal Poly and has been working with state parks for over 10 years. He's a self-taught cartographer who's always looking for new and exciting ways to understand our surroundings. Jeff is part of the natural resources team at the Slow Coast District and enjoys being outdoors and spending time with his family. Thank you, Jeff. Go ahead and take it away. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Ebner. Thank you, Monica, for that introduction. Uh, I am an environmental scientist with California State Parks here in San Luis Obispo, and our district is called the Slow Coast District. Um, yeah, so we do lots of mapping here. Obviously, everyone, if you're at this, you kind of like maps too. I love maps. Um, some people in the morning <laughs> read the the paper or look at their phone, and I look at maps, so I'm kind of a map nerd. Um, and I created a little presentation here today just to kind of go over some big topics and then kind of give you a quick little showcase over some things that uh, I've been working on and what we do here at the state parks level. So because I'm an environmental scientist, I primarily, you know, focus on resources and resource related issues, but there's been a need to kind of expand that to um, other departments, facilities, interpretation, law enforcement. And after uh, kind of playing around with it for a while and looking at all the data, we've kind of realized that everything is connected and mapping is the one, one language that we can bring everyone together. So I'm super excited about that from a parks point of view because it allows us all to kind of collaborate and kind of be on the same page. And so, yeah, we, I created this thing called a story map because to me, maps, they're stories, right? They're just, there's another form of stories. So kind of want to go over like, you know, what is a map? Just some data or data, however you want to say it. Like that's the, the, the nuts and bolts of a map. Some things from our program that we're doing now, and then some really cool stuff that I am really interested in historical mapping. And then I'll even show you how you can make your own map at the end. So yeah, maps, they explain the world around us. I mean, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we all are using maps, whether we're trying to figure out how to get to, you know, dinner, the closest Italian restaurant, or I'm planning a road trip, or, uh, you know, just you name it, you think it, it's it got a map or some, something involved with that. So bringing it back, I mean, I just, I thought this was interesting that the word map is actually, it comes from a Latin word, mappa mundi, which means napkin or cloth, and then the word mundi means world. So really the first kind of early maps, I mean, and then there's maps before this even, you know, um, prehistoric times of people just etching stuff into rocks to try to figure out their location of where they're at. 
but I don't know. It's just kind of an interesting thing that, you know, we always thought in 2D world back in the day, but now, I mean, maps, they're, they can be anything. So, you know, they're kind of a, they're, they're a relationship between elements in space, such as objects, regions, or themes. So maps explain things, right? And so I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but I just wanted to bring it to that maps are not always just maps that what we think of, right? So like when I think of a map, I think of a topo map like this. Um, this is like an 1895 topo map of our area. But I have a son who's less than a year old, and um, I'm pretty sure that when he thinks of a map, it's not going to be a paper topo map. It's going to be looking at his phone, Google Maps, or some kind of Google Earth or whatever it is when he's old enough to look at maps. So I think the term maps is changing in time right now. Um, and we have all different kinds of maps. You know, we have these interactive maps, which I'm really stoked about because it's not just a static picture. It's now there's information being told behind it, like this one right here, which is a cool one. It's just kind of showing um, the intensity of tornadoes by month for the US, kind of an interactive form. So you kind of can see, you know, intensity of tornadoes. And, you know, it's, they tell a story without saying it. So like this map right here is kind of funny to me. It's a, you know, per capita, how much spending in the US on beer and wine. And without even saying anything, you can look at this map and you can see that the middle of the country, they, they spend a lot of money on beer, you know, and it's interesting to me by without saying anything, you can kind of derive information out of a map, you know, and, you know, on the coast, we got some wine spenders. And then this one's interesting. It's Kauai for some reason likes to spend money on wine. Never would have thought that. So it's kind of, this is a good example of just how maps tell stories you can derive information out of them and now with modern technology we can do a lot more with them so you know maps they're constantly changing um like this is a great picture of a team from uc at usc medical they're mapping pathways brain pathways and neuron synapses for the brain which i always thought was fascinating that no one's actually ever mapped the brain and they're trying it now using mri technology so what you think of as a map is not a map, you know, it's, it's just a term, but maps can be used for so many different things, explaining relationships. Um, and then, you know, nowadays we have interactive maps and modern technology allows us to interact like we've never done before. You know, I can have huge data sets with billions of points. I can bring in live data. Like this map right here is um, for sea level rise for our area uh, in Morro Bay. And I can interact with it and I can run analysis and I can see the change over time if we got, let's hope not, let's hope we don't get a 10 foot sea level rise, but if we did, the whole campground would be underwater. So this enables us to make better informed decisions about planning. So this is a great example of an interactive map, not just a 2D map anymore. There's a lot of data behind this um, and you can do a run analysis it's all live, so I can move around to anywhere in the country. Uh, obviously, inland is not going to have sea level rise, but on the coastal side, um, yeah, we can do a lot with these maps. And so this brings me to a good point here, is that in today's fast-paced world, um, it was told to me by a cartographer from National Geographic, Alan Carroll, um, who's he's my idol. <laughs> if you ever look at a National Geographic map, that's done by him usually. And you know, he, he explained something to me at a conference I was at was that basically the human brain has three seconds to understand things. And it's, you know, good map design matters. So like when you first look at an image or let's say a map for this purposes, you know, it kind of, your brain perceives it as this and then one or two seconds, it's kind of jumbled. You kind of understand it. And not until three seconds into it does your brain really comprehend what's going on. So by designing your maps better, you actually get your information across better. So it's like this example right here. These are both the same exact map, same data, everything, but they just, one is portraying the information a little bit better than the other. I call these rainbow maps because they hurt my eyes. There's just a lot of colors. It takes my mind to a, lot, a while to focus on what's the information getting across. Where on this map, you can't see it because it's zoomed out far enough, but I, can tell you right now that I would be able to look at this legend and look at this map right away and get the information a lot quicker than I would over here and try to disseminate what what is it trying to tell me. So map design matters right, especially in this day and age where you know people have a three second attention span. And then 
yeah, the, the nuts and bolts, like I said, behind maps is the data because everything has a location. I mean, you name it, it has a location. And that's kind of hard to think about, but it's like, really, if you think about it, there's nothing in this world that doesn't have a location. I mean, besides some, you know, philosophical thing, but everything, every object has a location in this world. So we're trying to put, we're trying to figure out why is that there, you know, and how to get there or where is it kind of thing. So, you know, in state parks, since I'm a resource person, I'm an environmental scientist, I always look at, you know, the natural side of things first, you know, and I look at it, it's like a lot of our, our da historical data from the, from in the past was all handwritten. And it was just these long drawn out notes. And it's, um, I'm trying to think now it's like, we're using technology to digitally collect data. So it's more transferable and I think transparent and actually is gonna last longer in time. So it's really, we're doing the same thing that resource managers did hundred years ago or 500 years ago. They were just writing it down. We're collecting the data in a different way. It's being stored on servers now and not just in a pen and paper. So it's the same thing, just in a different mode. Um, and yeah, we're using technology to the max uh, here at State Parks. We use smartphones, tablets, um, high accuracy GPS, GPS units. Um, we're trying to standardize the data collection. So that's another thing I strive for is that everyone's collecting the data the same way. Because if you don't do that, then if I call something different, something different, then it's, it doesn't transfer really that well. So here at State Parks, we're all st we're standardizing the collection method so that everyone calls everything the same way and it all transfers over time. And yeah, we're, we're constantly, constantly with everything, with every project, every species, we are constantly collecting data out there. And when I first got to state parks 10 years ago, most of our stuff looked like this. And I'm sure everyone's used to seeing something like this, a big spreadsheet with a bunch of lines. And you're like, that's great, but I don't know where that is. And really, if you think about it back in the day, you know, even with just, last 20 years if you had a gps unit you would gps something and then you had to figure out how to get that that information off the unit put it onto a computer and then how do you display that it's just hard right but now with technology we just we have so many great options these days and especially with the internet so what i've done in our state parks here is i've tried to take all of our historical data all of our new data and stuff from outside sources and try to bring it in together into one manageable place, a one-stop shop, as I like to call it. And it's funny because I would have thought that this would have, this had been done already, but really it hasn't. So you were kind of on a new frontier here as far as uh, what um, resource agencies and government agencies are doing because we have this huge treasure trove of historical data, but we don't, we never had a way of really displaying it or managing it or analyzing it in one format. And now with technology and that everyone has computer and internet, it's more widely available, it's, it's transferable a lot. So I wanted to show everyone a quick peek at that. And so this is uh, our interactive map that I've created and it's, it's easily accessible. I don't have to download anything. It's just a web page. So it's referencing all of my data on my end, but the end user doesn't have to deal with all that. And it's great because it puts all of the layers kind of organized into one place. Um, and we have a lot of different stuff in here, as you can see. Um, you know, we, we can go through it and I can, um, you know, I can pick out and say, just show me the vegetation for the park. And it will should load up the vegetation. My internet is going a little slow, it looks like. <laughs> That layer did not load that well. Let's see, let's see if the oak habitat loads. There we go, so yeah. So it's like these layers are dynamic and I can instantly show just a layer that shows me all the oak trees in our county. Or I can go and I can say, what's the geology for our county? And so maybe if I zoom in, so I can actually find out the geology, the soils. I mean, we have everything from our, um, sensitive habitats in here, historic areas, or, you know, it's just putting everything in one place. And then you ask yourself, okay, cool, that's, that's nice, that's pretty, but what does that do for me? And so this is the real, the real kicker of this great product right here that I think everyone's starting to use now. And you'll see this in more agencies and programs in the future, but we have this thing called an environmental screening tool. And without getting too technical in the weeds of how this works, it simply 
which I've always wanted to do, is it allows you to click on the map within a specified buffer. So let's say I want a five, I want to know what occurs within this 500 foot buffer, let's say right here. So within that 500 foot buffer circle, I want to know what occurs there, what is there. And to me, this is the holy grail of everything because it's taking all that data and putting it into one place so that I can disseminate what is there. And the great thing is it will run a report. And this is where technology comes in here. And it will actually figure out what layers are intersecting within that buffer. So I know if I zoom in here, in that little 500 foot buffer, I have 2.2 .2 acres of riparian habitat. I know that there's 11.4 acres of baywood fine sand, which is another um, sensitive habitat. You know, we have our um, critical species here. I know my, my more, um, Mordella, my different plants. And so I think it's interesting too that it also does linear. So I know in that little 500 foot buffer that I have 970 feet linear feet of a creek. I look at that and now I look at this and this would have taken me 20 years ago, months to go and just in that 500 foot buffer, I'd have to run transects and run all these measurements in the field. But literally at the, my desktop computer now, I can tell you how many feet of the creek are there, what sensitive species interact, intersect in there. And then I can even run a report. So this is what our managers really like because now they can click a, click a simple button and it spits out a nice report for them um, in, a, in a PDF that they can print. And so if they're planning a project in a certain area, they know what kind of species or sensitive um, things they might have to deal with and get permitting for. So just kind of a quick little thing and it spits out a nice map for them. So now they don't have to even know how to make a map. They, it does it for them, which is in my mind, great. Cause I was getting bombarded with people just trying to make simple maps. So um, that is that, and I think we close this. And so, yeah, so that's our interactive map. That's bringing together all this historical and new data together, which I'm really jazzed up about it because we've never had this tool before. And as a land manager, it's nice for me to just have everything in one place. I don't have to go searching for it. And I can just send someone a link to that and they can do the same thing without um, pretty intense skills. And so another thing that I'm really fired up about, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm fired up about maps, is this thing called LIDAR. And some of you might've heard about this, some of you not. It's called light detection and ranging. And this is the future of terrain mapping right here. So for data, you know, the terrain, what's under everything to me is very interesting because we kind of know, like I can go out there and GPS a, you know, a sensitive species nest, but like, I want to see what I can't, I want to see what I can't see. And that's where this LIDAR comes in. And this picture is rudimentary, but it kind of does a good picture, a good representation of it. And it's basically planes um, or satellites can fly over the earth and they um, send out a multispectral laser beam. And the sensors on the plane can measure the time it takes and the reflectance. And so they actually can see through vegetation. So it's really fascinating. So one thing it does is it takes high resolution imagery, which is always nice for me because a blurry image is not gonna work for me, right? Um, but then on top of that, the high res imagery can also be filtered out and we can do infrared. So this is really cool here. So now I can, there's different sensors with that LIDAR and we can actually pick out living and dead things um, from just the imagery or actually I can even classify things. Like here's what it would look like in, the, in this program. It's creating a bunch of points, millions and millions of points. And actually you can classify stuff. So this is actually classifying that same, this picture right up here. These are buildings at the local college, Cal Poly. Um, it's classifying everything based on height. So we know that this is the highest building. These, these trees are higher than this parking area. So it looks like red is the highest and blue looks like is the lowest, that's the ground level. So we can actually derive elevation from this. I can even pull out just the vegetation and just the buildings, super fascinating. And so here I can even bring it into a 3D environment and I can just play with just, if I wanna see just the vegetation or just the buildings, I can play around with that. So LIDAR is fascinating in other senses. Like I said, it can see through vegetation. So archaeologists use this in like the Amazon and they've actually found full cities 
through the Amazon forest that were covered up by trees for who knows how many years and using LIDAR, they were able to find a full city under the Amazon can forest canopy. And they were actually able to find the old walls and the old building footprints and pyramids. It's just fascinating what you can do with this stuff. So LIDAR is the future. Um, you're hearing it more and more these days with um, you know, natural disasters and hurricanes. And um, that's where the Washington State uh, Natural Resource Agency, I, I feel like has done a great job um, explaining a little bit of that on the natural side of how LIDAR can be used. Um, so I'm always looking to this of new ways how to do LIDAR and how do we, how can we use it, right? And it, for me, it's great because this kind of, this is, and you'll have all these links after this, it kind of goes through just like what LIDAR is, but then it kind of shows you like, what, what, do I, what am I pulling out of the LIDAR? And basically it gives you these things called a digital elevation model. And it's a visual representation of elevation based on color, right? So the, the whiter color is lower and the darker brown is higher. And then I can even pull contours out of there. I can get hill shade, the aspect, which is the direction of slope. Um, but really it creates these, it, to me, it's this whole other world that we've never been able to see before because now we're seeing through, through the canopy, we're seeing through the buildings, we're actually getting the terrain and you know they can do really cool stuff as far as like landslide um, measurements. You know, and it just shows you, they're, they're beautiful pictures, I think too. It just shows you how this technology is just fascinating to me and it's, it's constantly developing, but like this picture right here is great. This is in upstate Washington. And you know, as a geologist or geomorphologist, you would try, if you're trying to map this landslide, it'd be really difficult when that, with that thick forest canopy, but with the invention of LIDAR, they're able to see actually the landslide occur and actually give it a volume so they can actually calculate how much volume of earth is moved from this because they can do it before and after. And if you were just looking at this right here, you would never see that. Um, another really cool thing I think about this LIDAR is, is how it depicts rivers. Um, to me, it's, it's beautiful. These are just beautiful images of it's showing the actual pathways of flow of river channels. And, you know, you would look at this river channel and you can kind of see that in this, the aerial imagery. But when you go to here, you're seeing actually more channel flows that actually go farther out than what you're actually seeing in the river channel. So this is really cool, um, a new way of looking at how we like observe our natural world with just with modern technology. And uh, the Washington State Natural Resources Agency has done a great job of, uh, you know, going the full force on, on LIDAR. Um, and so, yeah, so I try to do, I try to use LIDAR for us for our projects. Um, so this is a perfect example. Um, we have a pond up in our, one of our state parks called Harmony Headlands. And this is an artificial pond that was created by um, the previous landowners who are ranchers. And so this pond is, it's bermed up and it's got a lot of invasive uh, bullfrogs in there. And also it's not really functioning anymore. And we were able to figure out if we wanted to remove this levee right here that was artificial, how do we calculate that? Um, how much earth would have to be removed? And we wanted a better picture of what's actually going on here. And we we're starting to realize that this levee is actually not even doing anything because the LIDAR showed that we have this huge, it's actually diverting the levee and it's going around it. So it's not even functioning anymore like it was supposed to. It's still holding water, but um, it's actually creating a lot of unnecessary erosion. So just by using LIDAR, we were able to pull out, you know, I was able to get rid of the vegetation and get a real representation of um, elevation and volume for that uh, levee. And another one other thing I do with LIDAR is it can, you know, it can pull 3D objects. So like this is uh, one of our, you know, probably most famous monuments, Hearst Castle National Monument. And I was able to create a 3D um, view basically of the castle. And these are all buildings that were created from LIDAR. And then, you know, I can overlay that and I actually can pull out the vegetation. So it's pretty cool. What you can do is, you know, here I'm actually getting the real height of all the palm trees. Um, one of our projects was we were going to put a building, we were going to put a building in behind Hearst Castle and we needed to do a viewshed analysis from the tours and using LIDAR, we were able to see what um, 
what kind of vegetation screening we would need so that you wouldn't see the new building from the tours. So pretty cool what you can do with LIDAR. Um, obviously, like I showed you in that interactive map, we have uber amounts of resource data, right? Because that's how much, that's usually how it's all started is, you know, a sensitive plant here, sensitive habitat there. We need to put this on a map. Um, but I think that interactive map, which I showed you before, is kind of taking all this data and now putting it in some digestible format um, so that everyone can kind of make better informed decisions out what's out there. So if I was going to do a project out here, let's say build a trail, I would know what sensitive species I was going to intersect and maybe I have to mitigate for. Um, and then with technology, we're taking all of our... Um, our static data and now we're putting it into these things called dashboards so like you know when you look at a natural you know a natural disaster you see on the background and you know at the headquarters and the, and the incident command they got these big dashboards up with the whole state of california and we're creating the same thing but just for one species so like for one of our sensitive species that we've been monitoring on the central coast to see if it should get listed or a higher listing with fish and wildlife service is the black oyster catcher so we have volunteers going out into the field and they're collecting data on the nest. And from our perspective, we're able to have a snapshot in time so I can go back to 2015 and see that there was 27 nests monitored. You know, we had a 13% productivity rate per pair. So it's kind of cool is these dashboards are taking my mapping data and putting it into a digestible format that's interactive, you know, and I can see so many different things um, just based on on this dashboard, it's not just a bunch of GPS points in a spreadsheet like I showed before. It's actually taking that GPS point and spreadsheet and putting it points on a map. And I can click on all these points. I have a hotspot map so I can see where our hotspots are for the nest. I can tell you um, how many chicks and eggs because this is people in the field like I showed you before using their phones. So the standardizing of the data collection actually enables it so that everyone can talk the same talk. Uh, so these dashboards are really handy and this is the future. Uh, you're, you'll probably, if you haven't seen these already, you're gonna see more of them. Um, it's pretty much taking every agency now is using these dashboards to explain what's behind the map or what's behind the data because it puts it in just a simple form. And yeah, like a lot of stuff, I don't wanna go too much into the data, but we, you know, a lot of stuff we do is the fire. We do a lot of fire data and it's dictating a lot of how we're managing our parks these days. And it's kind of a hot topic. Um, we had a fire that came through that almost got to our park at Hearst Castle, which is like I said, one of our most uh, famous monuments. And so there's a lot of um, interest in how do we protect it and plan for it. And by using that fire data, we're actually able to make now um, wildfire plan maps. And we're you know, taking historical data and the terrain and the slope and the aspect and the vegetation type, putting all the layers together so that we can best plan for if we did get a wildfire, how would we manage that wildfire? And hopefully every, all the employees, all the personnel know what needs to be protected, what, can, you know, what we can leave alone or what's a hazard. Like for this right here, this purple line right here is um, power lines. So if we were having a fire at Hearst Castle up on this slope right here, we would not want any helicopters flying in this area. You know, obviously they would see that, but before they even get there, they're gonna know how to plan for that, um, that attack if they had to go, go after that fire. Um, so yeah, and then taking that, that data too, that's static. And now like for facilities, we have, we have uh, trail volunteers going out there into our trails. They're collecting, um, data on trails as far as like issues that's like a, for erosion or sign issue or a tree limb over a trail and so now I can take all their data that's throughout in the park and there's and this is only just filtered for this year but we've had you know a couple hundred points so far since this program has been started and I can see on a glance what needs to be done and how I can plan my trail crew to do more efficient work we know what's been completed, what's been reported. And I can even actually, these are interactive, right? So I can click and say, oh, look at that. Those points right there are just the ones that deal with signage. So I know I need to deal with those. Or actually, hey, I need to actually focus on just this person's in the map. We'll zoom in to that point. So I wanted to show this because this is basically an interactive, this is the future right here. This is not just a paper map anymore with 
a bunch of points. If someone went out there and took a bunch of points and said, here's a bunch of trail issues, I'd have a paper map. And then I'd really, I wouldn't be able to zoom in. I wouldn't be able to click. I can click on all these points, you know, and it will show me the information and it should show me a picture um, when it loads right there of what the issue is. So now I have a point and a picture. So I'm able to save a, so much time and money because I know what equipment I need to get out there before I get out there. So like, this is how maps are just changing the way that we run business every day. It's just making us more efficient and transparent. And um, it's just, and on top of that, it's just cool, right? I think it's cool to have all this stuff um, just explains things so much easier now. And I can, I can show someone something that I'm talking about without having to really explain it in depth. And then the last thing I wanted to show um, for this data is that, you know, we're pulling in data from, there's data sets from so many different places, USGS, federal, state, local, you know, your neighbor down the street <laughs> on Google street maps. So it's like, when you look at maps, there's just so much going into there. And I don't think we realize how much outside sources go into just, if you're opening up your phone and you want to look at the weather, there's like maybe 20 different data sources that go into that just to see where your local weather is, which I think is fascinating. Um, and like this right here's a picture. Um, there's a, the federal government has put up these satellites and they've made the information public now. And with the, you know, with the internet, I can tie into all this data sets where I don't have to, I don't have to have this physically on my computer. I can just link to it. So like here, this is a great, this is huge data set of the entire you know, US um, moisture index. So they can tell you what's wet and what's not wet on a simple term. And I have a little slider right here and I can actually see based on the, the satellite imagery where in our park is actually really dry. And maybe if we were planning a prescribed fire over there, or if we did get a wildfire over there, that's somewhere we would have to focus on because it's gonna go really fast or you know, we can make better management decisions based on this outside data source. So there's so much out there. And after this, uh, Monaco will send out a separate uh, links to all this stuff I'm talking about today. So you guys can play around with it yourself. And this is all free, which is really nice. Um, back in the day, you didn't, you basically had to have, you know, you had to pull an arm and a leg to get into this stuff. And then you had to have some master's degree in computer science to how to download that and figure out how to analyze it. But now I can just send this link to anyone and they can see where they're located and uh, information about that. So it's kind of cool how it's just simple now. Um, and then, yeah, I wanted to just go over a couple things on, uh, you know, just some I mean, we're, I'm working on a lot of different things, like I said, so I'm an environmental scientist, so I would deal primarily with resources, but over the years, it's kind of been made clear to me that not just resources, it's everything is connected, facilities, law enforcement, like I said, public input. So like, you know, obviously we're redoing, we're doing trail maps. This is what everyone thinks of maps, you know, now is they want a trail map, right, for our park and Updating the trail maps is a huge task because, you know, there's a lot of maps out there that were done at different time periods and different information. I'm trying to standardize it all so that all looks the same. You know, we have our boundary maps. Nine times out of 10, I get a question is, where is our park boundary? <laughs> or is this a park? So we have these and these are just the paper static maps, you know, so these aren't even half of what I actually do. Um, so we have historical stuff that we map out. For all of our permitting, you know, we have to kind of show where our historical features are if we're going to do a project in a historical area. We're mapping all of our utilities, which has been huge because before we had huge paper maps with many, many pages and they were black and white drawings and no one really could tell what they were. And now we're kind of overlaying that so my maintenance crew or facilities guys can go out there with their cell phones and they can see their location on this map and know that they're standing over a valve or they're standing over a fire hydrant and they can do inspections over time. So it's pretty cool how we're kind of changing the way we uh, manage our parks. You know, we're, we're analyzing the data too. So, you know, here we were, there was potential to put a, um, a repeater up on top of one of our hills and we needed a line of sight from the Natural History Museum to the repeater and using LIDAR and mapping techniques, we were able to find out which areas on the hill would have the best line of sight because we had to shoot radio waves through it. And what trees would we have to mitigate for if we were gonna have to you know, trim some of these trees because it needs the radio waves need a direct line of sight with no interference. 
So yeah, and, and other stuff I do is public facing maps, you know, beach closers. We all like, you know, we all love these ones that things tell us what we can and can't do. Um, some fun ones, I could do interpretation maps. Um, like this, we had an exhibit, World War II exhibit, and this was showing the Japanese internment locations from our central coast where kind of people got sent out to during World War II internment. Um, and then, yeah, now I'm bringing it into kind of the next step is uh, 3D mapping. And so, yeah, like for this right here, we had a potential proposed campground and I brought in the LIDAR. We built, you know, kind of using landscape architect techniques. We built cabins and proposed structures to see what it would look like in the real world terms. Um, and it's pretty cool. Like we here, we, I built this um, in a thing called Google SketchUp and then brought it into my mapping program. And so this was like a potential elephant seal viewing platform right here. Um, we were gonna plant a whole bunch of screening. You know, here are some cabins that we designed for state parks. So if this was a, if this campground did actually get built, you'd be able to rent cabins out and go to the elephant seals. And then part of that whole package was trying to derive um, some view shed analysis because from highway one, it's a scenic conservation easement. And so we actually can't, we have to screen the new buildings if we were gonna put new buildings. So here using our mapping, our maps, we are able to derive uh, which features would be hidden and visible from the highway or which ones would be visible from the highway. Um, so pretty cool what I could see without actually building any of these things or planting any of these trees. Um, we're able to see what kind of screening is done. So those are just a couple examples of stuff I'm working on. Um, a fun, a fun little map I'll show everyone here too is the story maps, because like I said before earlier, is I think maps are story. They're they're basically storytellers, and so I like to these things called story maps, which is what this presentation is actually on. And this was one I created a little bit ago. It's a little slow, and I always wondered it would be cool to do a story map of like what it looks like when the the birds are flying above the bait, bait ball, and then you scroll down. Oh, internet's going a little slow here. You scroll down. <laughs> uh, let it load. There we go. You scroll down and you see the bait ball. So I thought this was kind of cool. You know, you see the birds dive bombing. This is a fun little example of a story map explaining kind of our Moral Bay estuary. And then here, you know, obviously there's going to be a map involved. And so here it's like a 3D points of interest map that zooms in. And as you scroll, the map will zoom to different locations. And I'm not doing anything, I'm just scrolling through. This is just a web page right here. And so this was kind of a cool just interpretation map of some points of interest and in areas that I thought were interesting that we could potentially have in our museum or a QR code out in the park and someone could scan this and see this on their phone. But yeah, just kind of a cool exhibit of some interpretation maps and some cool 3D mapping, you know, and these are interactive, right? So you can click around and zoom and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, my passion, a lot of stuff I love to do is historical mapping because I'm always trying to learn from the past. And I think it's fascinating to know what was there before which explains what is there now. Um, and so like for this example right here, I like to take historical imagery and try to overlay it with new imagery. And so like here's our that monument, Hearst Castle. And it's fascinating what you can see. So this is an aerial image, I believe from 1937 or yeah, 1937. And where the visitor center now is, was the airstrip. And by overlaying that, you can actually see there's the visitor center. You can still see actually, parts of the airstrip that are still visible today. But I think it's fascinating seeing the historical imagery and historical mapping of what was there before kind of tells you why things are there, why things are the way they are. Um, you know, like here, we Hearst Castle had a, there was a whole zoo in the back of Hearst Castle. So here in the historical mapping, you know, you don't see that anymore, but here you would see exactly where it lined up or old buildings that aren't there anymore. So it's, I think it's fascinating to do mapping and historical, overlaying historical imagery, you know, learning from the past, trying to make better informed decisions of the future. Um, and then I like to find, I like to use these maps to find new things. So this was a cool 
little interactive map that I made just for fun, but then I actually started using it a lot more. And I basically it takes a this out this spyglass right here has got an 1897 uh, topo map in there. And as you move it around the map, it shows you the 1897 topo map. And I'm always like, oh, wow, like that's fascinating. These little black squares, that means there's a structure or a homestead. So this is how I go out and find old stuff that we don't actually see these days. Um, like, I think it's fascinating to see, for instance, the town of Morro Bay, you know, was just this little town. There was nothing else. This was all nothing in 1897. And then you look over here at the rock, the rock was an island. So by overlaying this, historical topo map i'm able to pull out information makes more sense to me now of like why things are it's like oh that's interesting the rock was an island that's why the bay has changed so much and we have all this um interesting flow patterns going on in here so yeah the historical mapping is really cool and i like to pull information out of there so like one thing is i was able to find actually an old historic structure just using that same map um I made this interactive map and there's this using um, federal data, this stuff called, it's the acronym is NDVI. It stands for Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Long story short, it pretty much gives you vegetation health. So for, I like to use a golf course as an example, because that's usually the healthiest vegetation that we have. So, you know, it shows you on a color scale, non-organic objects come out as orange and the darker colors means it's healthier vegetation. The lighter colors is less healthy. So, you know, if you're planting a farm or a vineyard agriculture, you can see where your, you know, crops are that are need a little more water. You know, you can pull out interesting things like I can see trails, you know, buildings, roads, but I was able to use this to find a historic structure that no one's ever been to. So in our park in Montana de Oro State Park, we have a old barn structure that has a corrugated metal tin roof. And if you correlate that with the NDVI, you can see how it pops out. And so I was just being a nerd and I was scanning through our park that people haven't scanned through in an area. And I found this corrugated metal roof that is way out in the middle of nowhere way outside of our park i mean our trail ends over here ish somewhere there's no trail system over here and so i was like that's fascinating we have a structure that i've never been to um and then we actually using my our historical mapping we were able to do a search party we hiked out there we found the historical structure um it was we've about a hundred years old and it was really cool it was made out of old uh, old growth redwood timbers it's collapsed by now but uh i mean no one had been there since this probably was since we became a state park in the 60s so it's a great example of just using historical mapping to actually find new things about our park that we never knew about and if i didn't have that ndvi where i was able to pick out the roofs and see um, inorganic structures i don't think i would have found that structure down in our park you know and we you know we use we use this historical mapping a lot. Like we've made a couple of story maps here, which you'll have links to, um, you know, and this is kind of fun stuff with interpretation program. You know, we've done some map, historical mapping on Montana Day Oro State Park, kind of figure out who the old homesteaders were using the old Mexican land grant maps. You know, they call the old rancho maps called plat maps. And so just seeing where the boundaries were and why our park is divvied up the way it is um, explains a lot. So yeah, these, these are kind of fun interpretation story maps that go into depth of certain topics. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of wanted to show everyone that, you know, you guys can get your own data too. There's this great, great website if you're a map nerd like me, called Topo View. And you just Google Topo View, all one word, T-O-P-O-V-I-E-W. And it's this is hosted by the USGS. And to me, it's fascinating because they put every single Topo map back to 1880 for free online. So you can click on an area, we'll click on our area, 
and you actually can download that topo map um, that you for that area. So I've always tried to get topo maps from historic, and you got to go to all these different spaces. But the USGS on this topo view has actually put it all there for you. And you can even go now. So if you're a hiker, you can actually go. I mean, you can download 2021 topo map. So you know, it's 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 pretty handy what you can do with this topo view. Definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and then, yeah, another thing that everyone should know how to do is Google Earth. It's probably, probably, hopefully everyone here has uh, heard of Google Earth and used Google Earth, but I just wanted to point out that you don't need to download anything with Google Earth. You actually can just go to a website called earth.google.com. That actually takes you to a web-based version of Google Earth. Um, and I wanted to show you that in Google Earth, you actually can create your own maps and you can even bring in your own LIDAR. So that, for example, here's LIDAR. I'm able to pick out old roads and trails. You know, I can zoom in without making people sick. <laughs> you know, you can, you can add a bunch of layers in here, but I, what I really wanted to show you is there's some really cool buttons that I don't know if people know about in Google Earth. First Jeff, button we aren't being, seeing your Google Earth screen, just so you know. You're not seeing it? No, no. Okay, let me. It's still on the story map page. It's on the story map. Okay, okay. Can you see it now? No. <laughs> okay. Let's try this then. How about now? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So, yes. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, thank you for telling me that because I was explaining stuff and people couldn't see it. Um, I just wanted to show you in Google Earth uh, how you can make your own map and actually play around with it. Um, there's this little button over here called historical imagery. And I love using this one. You can actually go into an area and click this little slider and it will go back to historical imagery. Very nice, very handy, kind of cool to play with. Um, so you can kind of play with different years. There's also really nice tools. You can do measurements in here. But what I think is kind of interesting too is that you can actually go to not just the Earth. You can go to Mars. Google Earth actually goes to Mars. <laughs> so it's fascinating. They have Google Earth for Mars. And if you zoom in, um, there's different stuff you can learn about, about Mars. You can even go to the moon. I mean... I've been using Google Earth a long time and it only like within the last five years, I've actually played around with this stuff. Cause I was like, what? You can actually go to different worlds in Google Earth. Really fascinating. I recommend everyone playing around with this in Google Earth. There's actually even a, you even have the ability to, uh, you can do a flight simulator if you really wanted to. Let me get back to where I was here. You know, if you wanted to fly, if you wanted to fly in Africa, you go up to tools, enter flight simulator. Yeah, look at that. You're flying, you're in a flight in Africa. Oh, without crashing the plane. And so you're able to, you know, you're able to go back in time. You're able to make measurements. You're able to bring in data. So Google Earth is very powerful tool. And then at the end of the day, you can actually make your own map. And that's what I wanted to show everyone is the last thing here is this little save image button right here. It takes your screen, you click save image, and it should allow you to create a map with a title, a legend, and you basically can save this as an image and send it to someone. So if someone's like, can you send me a map of so-and-so, you know how to make your own map now. Um, and then, yeah, that's about it here. Let's go back. And so, yeah, they're just, maps are a part of our everyday life. And uh, yeah, I think they're just constantly evolving. And uh, hopefully you learned a couple things today. There's a lot of topics to cover. Maps is very general. I just wanted to touch on a few things here. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jeff. That was super fascinating. I just, it was so crazy in like one of your first map ones, seeing the, how many layers you have just in the Montana de Oro region, like, with the species, with the plants, with everything. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so 
if you have time, we have a couple questions that came in. And if any sure. of you um, in the audience have come up with any questions, feel free to type it in the chat or Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, first question, um, the maps will be available to the public because um, I'll get that link sent out to everyone. But uh, what specific mapping software do you use? So I use this mapping software called ArcGIS. Um, the company is, is called Esri, E-S-R-I. And without getting too complicated, it's, they're like the Microsoft to Word or you know they're the Adobe to Photoshop. So Esri makes a program called ArcGIS and GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Um, it's kind of expensive. There's a lot you can do with it. But, you know, like, as you saw in that interactive map, I mean, you don't need that program. If you have Google Earth, you can do a lot with just Google Earth. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question. Have you done any maps to show expansion of vineyard land use in the region over time? Hmm. No, I have not. I primarily, since I'm at state parks, I kind of focus on the state parks. If I had my own mapping company, I probably would. Uh, but I think that actually is very fascinating um, to see overlay all those layers of how the vineyards have expanded, you know, and taking into account historical weather patterns and groundwater. I think it'd be a, very interesting to see start overlaying different layers with that ex, with the the expansion. So yeah, um, that's something I'd be interested in for sure. But I haven't done it yet. Thank you. And then this one. Uh says, no question, just a comment. Jeff, your enthusiasm and knowledge of mapping is infectious and fascinating. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm glad you guys got me when I haven't had more than two cups of coffee today. <laughs> I can talk very fast. <laughs> I think I'd be a little bit afraid of you on if you had more caffeine. <laughs> yeah, and I've also, I've tried to, I've got, given presentations before and I've, hopefully I try to strive so that people don't throw up when I'm moving around on those maps because it can get kind of dizzying at times. But um, yeah, I'm very enthusiastic about maps. <laughs> well, we love it. And we're super thankful that you were able to share that with us. Um, I don't see any more questions. I'll give folks like a couple more seconds to type it. But um, so Jeff is going to send me the link to this presentation, this story map, and I will get it sent out to all the attendees. And I'll also put it in the CSPA newsletter in case you want to pass it along to any of your friends. Um, but it looks like that's the end of our question. So thank you so much, Jeff. That was awesome. Super fascinating. We always learn such cool things in these virtual mind walks. So we're very thankful that you're able to join. Um, last minute thing for all of you in the audience, when you close out of the screen, there's a little survey that'll pop up. You don't have to answer it, but it's super helpful to us um, as far as planning for future virtual mind walks. Um, but that's about it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Have a great yeah. weekend and we'll see you next time. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.